after these three talks. If not, we're going to break for lunch and then come back and we have 15 or 20 minutes. So then, you know, sorry to have to hold questions for so long, but write, write them down just in case we don't have time. But maybe we could start with the question and answers. But anyway, so let me introduce our first speaker now in this um, mid-morning session. Um, Paul Kaplan is professor of art history at the School of Humanities, Purchase College, State University of New York, where he's taught since 1999. And as you know, he's one of the co-organizers of this event. He's a specialist in, in the Venetian, in Venetian Renaissance art and the visual representation of the black African diaspora from the Middle Ages to the 19th century. He's a major contributor to five volumes of the new edition of The Image of the Black and Western Art, published by Harvard University Press from 1910 to, 2010, to 20, 2010 to 2012. Okay. He's the author of several essays which address 19th century American artists, race, and European travel. He's currently completing a manuscript on this topic entitled Contraband Guides, American artists, African and African American subjects, and the European artistic tradition in the Civil War. It is entitled Monuments to Tyranny, Issues of Race and Power in 19th Century Responses to Italian Public Sculpture. Please welcome Paul Kaplan. Get the lights down again. Great. A great many of the most highly charged works of mid 19th century American public sculpture were produced in Italy. And thanks to the work of Melissa and many other contemporary scholars, including a, a number in this audience. We're increasingly cognizant of the impact of the Italian environment upon their form and content. That Italian environment has sometimes been divided into two rather separate halves, the art of the past on the one hand and the social polit and political conditions of the day uh, on the other. I think uh, Leonardo's talk uh, used the phrase what was and what is. And American travelers uh, of the 19th century often stressed that separation. In this talk, however, I want to emphasize how several monuments from the Renaissance and especially the Baroque era, in particular the Quattro Mori bronzes in Livorno, 1626, and the black telamones of uh, <coughs> the Pesaro monument in Venice from 1669 were read by American writers and artists in the light of contemporary political anxieties around race, slavery, and abolition. In my discussion, the most fraught and thus most revealing era runs from the 1850s into Reconstruction, but I'll also consider a few responses from well after 1876. So let's begin with the Quattro Mori in Livorno, the most famous work of the Tuscan Pietro Tacca. The monument as a whole began as a statue by Giovanni Bandini, up top, uh, of Duke Ferdinando de' Medici, the founder and promoter of Livorno, this new and cosmopolitan free port late in the 1500s. And though the ensemble has once been moved, it has always been displayed right in the port area. And you can see it across the boats today. Though Livorno welcomed Jews and commerce from Muslims, the point of Taka's four chained and despairing figures was to emphasize Ferdinando's suppression of Barbary piracy, and more generally to assert the dominance of a Christian ruler over Muslims. That dominance was embodied by the presence in Livorno of many captive Muslim galley slaves, where they stayed in a kind of prison hostel, which actually had a mosque inside, when they were not at sea, 
And two recent essays have richly explored this part of the work's content, including Taka's use of at least two galley slaves, Ali and Morjano, as models for his enslaved figures. Morjano's facial features, in all likelihood, are those of the one figure in the group of four who is unmistakably a black African. The other three instead exhibit traits of North Africans and Ottoman Turks as they were then understood. The term Mori, or Moors in English, is a complicated one, sometimes denoting North African Muslims, but also, more specifically, peoples of sub-Saharan African descent, and Taka's four figures of clearly varying ethnicity sum up the ambiguity of this word. Livorno remained the principal Tuscan port, and Taka's figures were by far the best known works of art in a city not otherwise distinguished by cultural attractions. In April of 1799, after the city had fallen under French control, the local commander, General Sextius Mioli, proposed, in a revolutionary spirit, to pull down the statue of Ferdinando and to free the slaves from their chains. Quote, as Mioli wrote, a single monument exists in Livorno, and it is a monument to tyranny, which insults humanity. Four unfortunate men, a hundred times braver than the ferocious Ferdinand, accents of pain, indignation, and hatred must agitate every sensitive soul who approaches it." End of quote. This remarkable proposal is well known to scholars, but what has never been mentioned is that Mioli's character, and consequently his reaction to Taka's Moors, was significantly shaped by his experience fighting with the rebellious American colonists in 1780 to 1781. He would have noted the presence of black troops among the American forces north of New York City, and during his participation in the Yorktown campaign, he would have been much exposed to slavery. Lafayette, the leader of the French forces under whom Mioli served, explicitly rejected the enslavement of African Americans as a result of this experience, and it is likely that Mioli's fury at the statue had a similar source. The alterations demanded by Mioli, however, mostly failed to take place, and the full monument was quickly restored after the departure of French troops a few months later. Livorno continued to be the most important hub of shipping on the west coast of central Italy. It is a piquant coincidence that Taka's chained figures observed, so to speak, the passage of two of the most celebrated works of American sculpture produced in Italy. Hiram Power's Greek Slave in 1845 and Thomas Crawford's Freedom in 1858. Powers frequently visited Leghorn, as it was then called by English speakers. And in fact, in 1849, he traveled to the American consulate there to apply for a patent on replicas of the slave, asserting ownership of what we might call an already captive subject. He could hardly have failed to study Taka's work with its prominent chains and despite the many differences, medium, gender, pose, and affect, between his creation and Taka's, we may suspect it had a conceptual impact on him. For even those visitors to Livorno who approved of the Duke's mastery over his captives tended to admire the pathos of the slave figures. As for Crawford's freedom intended for the dome of the US Capitol, it had already been the subject of a heated transatlantic dispute in which Crawford's plan to include a liberty cap, the ancient marker of a manumitted slave, was rejected by Jefferson Davis as an impermissible reference to slavery. In a further turn, when this work was finally cast in 1862 in Washington, an enslaved craftsman famously played a vital role. And here I might add that in Don's talk last night, he told us that the Servius Tullius inscription also passed through Livorno on its way 
to commemorating uh, Lincoln as emancipator back in the United States. So a further irony there. To return to Taka's creations, some echo of Miolis' outrage about them can be found in the Scots cleric Thomas Henry White's 1845 Pilgrim's Reliquary, where the work is characterized both as magnificent and the most pitiless production of sculpture. The pompously haughty ruler is mocked, but White expresses pity for the, quote, four naked fellow creatures chained and writhing in the most abject postures of captivity. He continued, it is enough that people triumph, it is enough that people suffer, but let the triumph and the suffering be at least be transitory here, end of quote. Josephine Epps, the Philadelphia-raised wife of a Virginia slaveholder, expressed a similar sympathy with the pain of the figures in a private, unpublished reaction to them in 1851. Quote, four slaves chained at the corners of the pedestal, writhing with their hands fettered behind them and faces expressing so much despair and mental suffering as inimitable, end quote. Likewise, Julia S. Hawks of Springfield, Massachusetts, in a wonderfully strange 1844 textbook for teachers of French that is in, uh, entirely composed of epistolary discourses on Italy, lamented that, quote, the expression of so much anguish will haunt my imagination for many days to come. But most mid-century Americans, especially those from the South, were less disturbed by the public commemoration of slavery, even though in the antebellum US itself, public monuments were generally purged of any reference to African Americans and their enslavement. Karen Lemmy, who's here, has documented the mostly unsuccessful attempts of the sculptor Henry Kirk Brown to challenge this taboo. In 1861, the future Confederate governor of Louisiana, Henry Watkins Allen, called the Livorno Monument well thought of and astonishing, though he made the interesting claim that all four of the chain figures were, quote, black Turks. Douglas French Forrest, an officer in the Confederate Navy stranded in Europe in 1864, referred to the Moors as, quote, a fine specimen in bronze. Frederick de Bourg Richards, a Philadelphia painter and photographer whose 1857 travel book is marked by racist and anti-Semitic asides, found the statues very fine. As late as 1909, Henry James, in his Italian Hours, repeated Henry Watkins Allen's mistakes. Quote, four colossal Negroes in very bad bronze are chained to the base of the monument. It should be noted that for James, the badness of the work implies no critique of bondage per se. If anything, James is still supporting the antebellum notion that there was inherently something in poor taste about representing people of African descent on such a public monumental scale. The indecorousness of the Baroque style and of blackness are linked here. Something similar, but perhaps more poisonous, can be found in the 1858 reaction of Nathaniel Hawthorne's wife, Sophia Peabody Hawthorne, to a group of sculptures, some of which are still located in the vestibule, leading into the main precincts of the Uffizi Gallery. And uh, you can see them along here, okay? In this case, however, the subjects are not slaves, but rather the Medici themselves. Uh, Cardinal Leopold, uh, Sophia Peabody Hawthorne wrote, is, quote, almost monstrous. This is the figure on the left. From an admirable economy in nature, what should have been brain is, in Leopold, under lip, certainly the biggest I ever beheld in a white man, and as coarse as a Negro's. There are two others who also have an African coarseness of conscience. These ruled my beautiful Florence. Cosimo II, she continued, 
probably a mistake for Duke Cosimo III, who's seen on the right there. Quote, looks like a Negro, she said, with frightful, thick, prominent lips. And indeed, they are a fearful set of men. Oh, beautiful Florence, how insane must have been your conduct to fall into the hands of such keepers, end of quote. These peculiar comments may be based in a confused way on Mrs. Hawthorne's having heard the story of the first Medici Duke of Florence, the illegitimate Alessandro, died 1537, whose mother was a slave of either North African or Black African origin. But there was no bust of him in the vestibule, and Sophia Hawthorne does not mention him. As for her particular motivation here, the racist panic of the passage may be linked to her husband Nathaniel's aversion to abolition and subsequent lack of support for the egalitarian aspirations of African Americans during the Civil War. Sophia Hawthorne's words were in fact first published in 1869 in the middle of Reconstruction. I now want to shift our view toward Venice to the tomb of Doge Giovanni Pesaro, died 1659, in the Church of the Frari. This 1669 sculptural ensemble was architecturally conceived by Baldassare Longhena and executed by Juste Lacour and Melchior Bartel. Much of the tomb, including the portrait of Pesaro, a largely ineffectual leader, is rhetorically conventional, if overblown, but the four colossal, writhing, grimacing African men who serve as telemones supporting the effigy of the deceased are hard to ignore. Perhaps inspired by Taka's work in Livorno, they are more particularly derived from the classical idea that defeated captives should hold up the monuments of those over whom they triumphed. Uh, 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 or, sorry, <laughs> the defeated captives should hold up the monuments uh, of those uh, who triumphed over them, and appear to make overblown reference to the Doge's success against the Ottoman Turks in the struggle for Crete. Crete had, in fact, been conquered by the Ottomans by the time the monument was erected. The contrast between the black marble of the figures and the white marble of their ragged garments is handled with considerable virtuosity. Late Baroque sculpture had long been out of fashion in the mid-19th century, and English and other European travel essayists generally failed to mention this tomb in their accounts of Venetian masterworks. But one exception is Sir Francis Palgrave, the author of the 1842 first edition of the London publisher John Murray's influential Handbook for Travelers in Northern Italy. Palgrave called it, quote, a curious specimen of the odd taste of the 17th century, unquote, and noted the colossal moors or negroes of black marble. In the 1856 sixth edition, odd taste was replaced by bad taste. Visitors, however, frequently wrote of this monument in letters and travel memoirs. I, uh, so far, I've found more than a dozen examples, and I'm sure there are more out there. The tomb and its African figures are given the greatest emphasis in the widely read Six Months in Italy by George Stillman Hillard, issued in 1853 and often reprinted. Hillard was appalled by the tomb, calling it, quote, a caricature in marble, and claiming that, quote, in grotesqueness and bad taste, this monument has no rival in all Europe, unquote. The main target of his distaste were the Africans. Quote, the most prominent objects are four enormous Negroes, or Moors, of black marble, but dressed in jackets and trousers of white marble, and oddest of all, the artist has represented them with their knees and elbows protruding through rents in their garments, end of quote. He never quite explains why the Africans are so offensive, but like Henry James in Livorno, one gets the sense that he was not upset by the dehumanization of the figures, but rather regarded them as an unforgivable breach of decorum. Hillard, 1808 to 1879, 
was in the middle of a successful career as a Massachusetts lawyer, politician, and writer, and as a younger man, was one of the closest friends of Charles Sumner. They became law partners and shared an interest in abolitionism in the early 1840s. Hillard, however, did not follow Sumner's more radical path, and in the late 1840s, he adhered to the faction of the Cotton Whigs, who argued for an entente with Southern slaveholders that resulted in the Compromise of 1850 and the Fugitive Slave Law. When Sumner was elected a Massachusetts senator on an anti-slavery platform in 1851, Hillard supported his opponent. In the 1850s, Hillard's wife Susan apparently concealed fugitive slaves in the attic of their house, but it's not clear if her husband knew of this. And in his official duties, he was supposed to assist in the recapture of escaped slaves. The Pesaro tomb, wrote Hillard, quote, is like the monstrous architecture of a feverish dream, and there is matter enough in it for a whole stud of nightmares. We can imagine that for Hillard, there was a connection here to the nightmare of American slavery and the intractable national political struggles and personal moral choices it had engendered, which he preferred to repress. The progressive Southerner, Octavia Walton LeVere, also called attention to the African figures with their thick lips and woolly heads. In her popular travel memoir of 1857, aesthetically, she agreed with Hillard on the tomb as a whole. She said, there surely was never a great expenditure with a worse result. But the most forthright opinion about the tomb and its Africans was expressed by Erastus C. Benedict a New York Republican legislator and educator. Benedict's book, A Run Through Europe, recounted an 1854 trip, but was published only in 1860 on the eve of the Civil War. Benedict did not criticize the style of the tomb, but his interpretation of the African figures is revealing. Quote, a most striking, singular, and stupendous monument is that erected to the Doge Giovanni Pesaro. One would think it was as much a monument in honor of Negro slavery as of the Doge, although I'm not informed he had any connection with slavery. The tomb is supported by brawny and gigantic Negroes sculpted in black marble, dressed in white marble, ragged in rent, through the tatters of which their black knees and elbows stick out and their ebony skins are exposed. And let me... Uh, give you a detail of one of these figures so you can see this. Many other descriptions of the Africans in the monument then followed in the 1860s and later, of which two are, partic are of particular interest because they confused the physical task of the statues to hold up the, support, supporting, hold up the structure supporting the doge himself with the forms of black labor more typical of the 19th century. A published account of an 1869 trip asserts the cushions above the men's shoulders were bales of cotton. And an 1895 publication affirmed that they were bags of coffee. As by the 1860s, the Pesaro tomb had become virtually a virtually required stop on any American's tour of Venice, it's no surprise that Mark Twain touched on it as well in Innocence Abroad of 1869. The only Venetian church interior that Twain wrote of was that of the Frari, and the Pesaro tomb takes uh, up most of this, but his account of the African figures is not much more than the conventional description of his predecessors. He judged the work as a whole ingenious but absurd. However, it was selected by Twain or his editor for illustration, the only illustration of the tomb I've been able to find in these numerous American accounts. And the illustrator seems not to have had access to an image of the original, since the tomb in the picture is largely unrecognizable. Twain's familiar emphasis on the ragged clothing of the Africans is reproduced, but their stance, uh, expression, and headgear, turbans, make them look more like the conventional painted wooden statues of black African servants of the 18th to 19th centuries that are often referred to today as Blackamoors. This deformation would not have troubled Twain or his publishers, as the book's illustrations are generally more humorous than accurate. But the decision to illustrate this monument at all confirms the iconic status of the Africans of the Pesaro tomb for Americans during the Civil War era. <laughs> 
Perhaps the attention to these figures as a, quote, monument to Negro slavery, unquote, consoled the writers and their audience who could at least take comfort that the now extinguished peculiar institution in the United States was not entirely an American invention. One American commentator on the Pesero tomb I've so far neglected is William Dean Howells. His 1866 Venetian Life, the memoir of his time in the city as American consul during the Civil War, contains at least a half dozen significant race-inflected passages. The section on the Pesero tomb is in fact fairly perfunctory, but much more interesting for our purposes is his characterization of the 1500 sculptural group of the Adoration of the Magi, a set of mechanical figures which periodically emerge to worship the Madonna and Child prominently displayed on the clock tower. And here's the Madonna and Child and the Magi, the mechanical Magi come out here. And this is what they look like. Uh, uh, and this, of course, is all in Piazza San Marco, right opposite the church. Howells described these mechanical wooden statues in action and concludes the description as follows. Last, he wrote, comes the Ethiopian prince, gorgeous in green and gold, who, I'm sorry to say, burlesques the whole solemnity. His devotion may be equally heartfelt, but it is more jerky than that of the others. He bows well and adequately, but recovers his balance with a prodigious start, altogether too suggestive of springs and wheels. Perhaps there is a touch of the pathetic in this grotesque fatality of the black king, whose suffering race has always held mankind between laughter and tears, and has seldom done a fine thing without leaving somewhere the neutralizing absurdity. But if there is, the sentimental may find it, not I. Now here, Howells uses the most common and generally the most favorable major role assigned to Africans in Renaissance art, that of one of the three magi, to demean rather than exalt the race. The clock tower's black African magus was the first fully public articulation of this sacred character in Venice and one of the most conspicuous versions to be seen anywhere in Europe. The mechanical movements of all of the figures in the group are identical and no other writer has ever characterized the clock tower's black, black magus king as particularly clumsy or ridiculous. Indeed, there's little to suggest that anything about the group was intended to be comic. Yet Howell's characterization ends up by superimposing a 19th century minstrel show trope upon this Renaissance sculpture. Also harsh is Howell's claim that the figure is at best proficient only at bowing, as if to imply an inborn subordination among people of his race. Paradoxically, just above the Magi, at the top of the tower, there's a group of bronze sculptures nicknamed as Mori or Moors, but originally intended to depict captive wild men of medieval myth, whose ceaseless labor in striking the bells is a much stronger articulation of racial subordination. There's actually a lovely pamphlet published after the Napoleonic annexation of Venice in Venice itself, consisting of a dialogue between the wild men, one of whom wants to take the opportunity to run away from his forced labor, while his colleague is fearful of freeing himself from his eternal bondage. But Howells does not address these bronze bell ringers, only the black African magus. Howells' condescension to the black magus is, of course, related to his ambivalence about the profound political changes of the day. He was a Republican by party. He owed his post to a campaign biography of Lincoln he'd written in 1860. But like many others in his party, he was often fearful of and skeptical about African-American claims to full equality. He was also something of a skeptic about the Venetian enthusiasm for the Risorgimento. He makes equally condescending remarks about how unready most Venetians are for the demands of a democratic government. Venice remained, of course, in an Austrian possession until late in 1866, several years after Howell's departure. In the final sentences of his book, however, he somewhat grudgingly acknowledges the justness of Venetian aspirations in terms that clearly evoke African-American emancipation. Howells wrote, 
The Venetians desire now, and first of all things, liberty, knowing that in slavery men can learn no virtues. And I think them fit with all their errors and defects to be free now because men are never fit to be slaves." End of quote. And strangely enough, in 1866, even as Venetian life was being published, Howells also offered, in the pages of the Atlantic Monthly, the radical proposal that figures like John Quincy Adams Ward's small but potent bronze freedmen be adapted for Civil War memorials. At the very least, Howell's exposure to Venetian sculpture had acclimatized him to the figuration, the public figuration of people of color. In the final part of this talk, I want to consider American reactions to representations in Rome. Few Americans of this era seem to have commented on the prominent black African figure embodied in South America in Bernini's Fountain in Piazza Navona. As a work in white marble, it was not as unmistakable as images of Africans in bronze or black stone, and its confusing identification with the Americas, rather than Africa, which is here denoted by a white figure of the Nile, may have struck too close to home. In fact, some Romans of this era apparently thought all Americans were black. The most significant image of the Magi in Rome was a painting on the high altar of the chapel inside the Palazzo della Propaganda Fide near uh, Piazza di Spagna. The center of the church is Many Americans visited this institution, but rather than commenting on the painting, they noticed the African and African-American priests in training who performed public readings of sacred texts on January the 6th, the anniversary of the Magi's visit to Bethlehem. Here's the uh, African figure in the painting. Margaret Fuller's 1848 account is one of the most elaborate and it probably helped her to revise her previously dismissive notions about abolitionism. William Wetmore's story surely went to hear a version of this popular performance, and one may wonder if it had some impact on the development of his anti-slavery sermon in stone, that's what he called it, the Libyan Sybil. Harriet Beecher Stowe had claimed she had inspired Story's work in regaling him with her impressions of Sojourner Truth, whom Stowe, in fact, elsewhere likened to a statue made of dark materials. Indeed, the most striking Roman encounter between an American traveler and an actual sculptural depiction of a black African was experienced by Stowe. While in Rome in 1860, Stowe gratefully accepted a gift of a cameo, probably rather like this one. I have not yet traced uh, the one that I'm about to describe, depicting the head of an African, an event recounted by her friend Annie Fields. Stowe and Fields were visiting the Castellani Brothers jewelry shop, full of antique objects and modern reproductions. Among them was the, quote, among them, said wrote Fields, was the head of an Egyptian slave carved in black onyx. It was an admirable work of art, and while we were enjoying it, one of them said to Mrs. Stowe, Madam, we know what you've been to the poor slave. We are ourselves but poor slaves still in Italy. You feel for us. Will you keep this gem as a slight recognition of what you have done? Fields continued, Stowe took the jewel in silence. But when we looked for some response, her eyes were filled with tears, and it was impossible for her to speak." End of quote. Such cameos survived from the ancient Roman period, and many more were made in Italy in the 16th and 17th centuries, though they do not seem to depict slaves. But this was surely how both Stowe and the Castellani understood such an object, and the transaction was a poignant and paradoxical one. The jewelers gave her a slave, so to speak, and yet the gift transformed the artwork's meaning in a way that could never be achieved with the images of slaves in Livorno or Venice. As if to endorse the significance of the gift, Stowe published a letter, hardly discussed by scholars, at just this moment, which powerfully joined the two causes of abolition and reunification. Entitled, Italian and American Liberty, 
This is its central passage, and I'll conclude with it. Liberty. Americans have forgotten what the word means. Pampered children of prosperity, with both hands full of opportunity and none to hinder the fullest use of it, they know nothing what liberty or slavery means. Only the Africans of the South are learning in a hard school to be patriots and heroes, learning in bitter sighings and endless longings how fair is freedom. The earthquake that shakes Austria and Italy and France is under, American, under America also. The ground trembles there also with the approaching footsteps of the great deliverer who shall save the poor and needy and precious shall their blood be in his sight. Blood of Roman peasant or African slave is alike the blood of Christ's child and for every drop will he reckon. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. That was great. Wonderful talk. Um, I'd like to introduce Adam. And you, where's Adam? Yeah, you can fix your PowerPoint. <laughs> um, Adam Thomas is curator of American art at the Palmer Museum of Art at the Pennsylvania State University, where he also teaches in the art history department. He received his BA from New York University, an MA and PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He is the recipient of fellowships from the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the Huntington Library, among other institutions. Adam recently organized the large-scale traveling exhibition, Wild Spaces, Open Seasons, Hunting and Fishing in American Art, which opens later this month at the Dixon Gallery and Gardens in Memphis, Tennessee. The catalog published by the University of Oklahoma Press um, accompanies the exhibition, and he contributed an essay to the catalog. His talk today is entitled Racial Hybridity and National Prophecy in Elio Vedder's The Cumaean Civil. Please welcome Adam Thomas. So my thanks to the organizers of the conference, particularly to uh, Melissa and Paul, and my thanks to all of you <clears throat> for coming today. It's a pleasure to be here, pleasure to speak to you this afternoon. In 1876, the American artist Elihu Vedder, who spent the majority of his life in Italy, completed the Cumaean Sibyl. The culmination of at least nine other related works spanning the course of the previous 13 years, Vedder's painting was also his largest to date. At 38 by 59 inches, or about 96 by 150 centimeters, and prominently signed in the lower right corner, it was clearly intended to be a major statement by the artist then residing in Rome. Although it has been noted that the painting marked a new direction for Vetter, its somber tone and foreboding stood in biographical terms with Vetter mourning the death of his eldest son, aged just five years in 1875. His second son had died in 1872. Indeed, Vetter's art more generally has often been regarded as intensely personal, and the conventional view of him as a quasi-symbolist, relying on so-called visionary powers of imagination, often positions him as unconcerned with or untouched by the broader affairs of his time. Certainly his penchant for mysterious, allegorical, and literary subjects, with mortality being a consequential leitmotif of his work, lends itself in part to this kind of reading. And yet, today, I would like to put forth an understanding of Vedder's Cumaean Sibyl that both expands on and moves beyond the personal. I propose that Vedder's painting is also something more than a mere update 
of well-known antecedents, such as those representations of the mythical humane Sibyl figure by Michelangelo or Domenichino, to cite just two local examples. Mine instead is a more capacious effort to pinpoint what is novel and timely about Vetter's rendition of this subject to return him to the social and political circumstances of the 1860s and 70s in two nations, the United States and the newly formed Italy. As recounted by uh, Dionysus of uh, uh, Halicarnassus of the first century BC in his Roman antiquities, the Cumaean Sibyl offered to sell nine prophetic books to uh, Lucius Tarquin Tarquinius Superbus, uh, also known as Tarquin the, the Proud, the last king of pre-Republican ancient Rome. And by the way, the uh, uh, king that followed uh, Servius Tullius, whom uh, Paul and uh, Don have uh, mentioned, and, and the that uh, uh, more beneficent ruler that preceded him. Uh, the king here dismisses uh, the Sibyl, laughing at what he regards as her exorbitant price. In response, she burns three of the books. Later, the Sibyl returns with the remaining six books and offers to sell them at the same price as the original nine. Uh, Tarkin, again, is unwilling to purchase them. Again, she burns three more books. When the Sibyl returns a final time, offering the last three books at her first price, the king, having conferred with his augurs and realizing his error, acquired the books. The Sibylline books subsequently uh, became crucial to decision-making in Rome. Purportedly, when the Senate needed direction in times of crisis, its seers would consult the books. So here I want to explore how the tale and the implications of prophecy in Vetter's own time resonated with the Italian Risorgimento, the movement for Italian national awakening and self-rule that resulted in the achievement of unification. I ask what it might mean to read the painting against the backdrop of the fraught issues of rulership, independence, and uh, nationalism. Even more, Vetter's The Cumaean Sibyl addresses an ever-widening set of concerns in the post-Civil War era United States particularly a shifting discourse about the complexities of racial identity and self-determination. So it may seem odd to some of you to treat Vetter and his painting in relation to these kinds of worldly matters, but consider Vetter's earliest days in Italy, an experience that suggests his keen awareness and much more of its political upheavals. Vetter arrived in Florence in 1857 and frequented the Cafe Michelangelo where the group of, pa of Italian painters known as the Macaioli congregated. In his autobiography, Vetter recalled living in a state of limbo in Florence between the upper echelons and the lower reaches of society, but that he gravitated toward the Bohemian segment. He states, quote, I was a fierce Republican and thought titles foolish and wrong. Referring to the overthrow of Grand uh, Duke Leopold II of Tuscany, who was expelled in April 1859 in the Second Italian War of Independence, Vetter writes, finally, there came a great day in Florence. The Italians were coming. The Grand Duke was going. There had been much plotting in the Cafe Michelangelo. I had not been taken into the plot, but being a rank Republican was considered one of them. He goes on to note that on the occasion, he was among those who, quote, fraternized with the soldiers, the Italian colors were hoisted and the bands broke out in Garibaldi's hymn and other patriotic airs. The artist Nino Costa became an especially close friend. Costa, who pursued radical politics and had fought in various campaigns, including under Garibaldi in the 1847, excuse me, 49, defense of Rome, made his way to Florence in 1859. It is not just that Vetter was influenced by these artists' experiments in block color effects and shared their interest in sketching the rough Italian countryside as evident in the works by Vetter and Costa here. It is also that Vetter was exposed to the way landscape painting could provide subtle social commentary. As the art historian Albert Boim observed, the Macaioli painter's frequent depiction of the Tuscan countryside reflected a broad range of rural social relations, and their work dovetailed with efforts at agrarian reform. For Costa, in particular, quote, political aspirations joined with contemporary landscape metaphors. 
whereby apprehending the geological, agricultural, and historical makeup of the region served the cause of a regenerated Italy. Even if Vetter's painting here does not necessarily aspire to the same political ends as Costa's say, there are compelling reasons to reconsider the way current events inform his art. Take Vetter's youth in red jacket from these years. The red shirt, of course, became a potent symbol in 1860 because of the expedition of a thousand in southern Italy. The distinctive loose hanging uniform was, of course, then worn by and identified with Garibaldi's forces and featured on the left in uh, Girolamo Indugno's uh, image of the man himself. But Garibaldi had apparently adopted the colored garment of one sort or another as early as 1843 at least partly as a way to affirm the association of red with liberty and republicanism. What interests me here is not so much the striking postural similarity of the two figures or the near identical tilt of their hats or even whether the artists were acquainted, but rather the way contemporary and historical costume get overlaid in Vetter's work. That is to say, undoubtedly his is a depiction of a young man from centuries prior there is also the possibility that he has, to some extent, absorbed the coded visual language characteristic of the Macaioli. Youth in Red Jacket may have been preparatory to a painting such as The Music Party. Notice the resemblance to the performer in the immediate foreground, for instance. Nevertheless, the temporal distance that both paintings establish seem indebted to the tendency on the part of his Italian coterie to disguise political or nationalistic views within historical genre scenes. For example, in Cabianca's painting, on the left, from a series featuring storytellers and troubadours, also incorporates Renaissance costumes, but as Albert Boim pointed out, the figures assemble in the gardens of contemporary Florentine villas, quote, telescoping past and present in a historical continuity that declared the Macaioli and their patrons who owned the villas the equal of their counterparts in the age of Boccaccio. The painting thus uses historical packaging to mediate and, ass and assert modern parallels. Further, this comparison to Cabianca suggests that Vetter was still under the sway of the Macaioli late into the decade, well after he left Florence for the United States at the end of 1860. Regardless of Vetter's precise investment in Italian Republican values, I think it worth taking seriously that his formative years abroad coincided with a time of intense political agitation and how steeped he was in the strategies of representation of his Italian peers. Returning to the Cumane Sibyl with this history in mind, tracking its earlier versions helps reveal the particular pressures impinging on the painting. For Vetter repeatedly returned to the subject more so than any other as a kind of obsession. The figure in Vetter's painting has been traced to depictions of Jane Jackson, an emancipated African-American slave living in New York whom Vetter encountered during the Civil War Vetter himself acknowledged as much. During the war, discussing the war years in his autobiography, Vetter writes, quote, I never wavered in my hope of our ultimate success or in my hatred of slavery or in my loyalty to the nation. Vetter had witnessed the atrocities of the slave trade firsthand growing up off and on in Cuba, the largest slave colony ever created in Spanish America where his father, a dentist, moved in 1841. His father also owned slaves, as did Vetter's ancestors, ancestors in uh, New York State. Among various traumas, Vetter remembered the suppression of a rumored slave revolt. The sound of the whip was so incessant that my father had to close all the doors and windows to keep it out. Even in New York, he remembered seeing African Americans lynched in Jamaica, Long Island, the victims known to him, apparently, as he was a schoolboy. During the draft riots in New York City in 1863, Vetter recalls horrific scenes of rioters, quote, burning a Negro orphan asylum and its inmates and hanging Negroes to lampposts and burning them. On the next page uh, of his autobiography, he relates then meeting Jane Jackson, who he used to pass on the street corner near his studio. 
She sold peanuts and perhaps uh, newspapers or other things. They became friends, writes Vetter, quote, she had been a slave down south and had at that time a son, a fine tall fellow, she said, fighting in the Union Army. Vetter then bridges the 1865 portrait on the right with the 1876 Cumaean Sybil. Time went on and I, find, I found myself in a mood. As I always try to embody my moods in some picture, this mood found its resting place in the picture of the Cumaean Sybil. Thus this fly, or rather this bee in my bonnet, was finally preserved in amber varnish and thus Jane Jackson became the Cumaean Sybil. So I want to emphasize here that the nature of Vetter's mood as it is defined by the conjunction of uh, war and mob violence of the preceding pages as it is by the personal encounter with Jane Jackson. Indeed, it is a mood relating to suffering and death, but not just that of his sons. In the structure of his narrative, she encapsulates this tempestuous national mood which, get, which gets refigured in Vetter's obsessive return to her image. The painting on the right was of such consequence to Vetter that he sent it to the National Academy in New York when elected an associate member that year, and it was subsequently in the institution's annual exhibition. Praising the painting in a newspaper article on June 3rd, 1865, the essayist and poet George Arnold found that it confirmed, quote, Vetter's talent and his power over all the material of his art. The phrase, that word all in particular, suggests how the painting stood out from the, quote, weird qualities and, quote, eccentric fancy of the other Vetter pictures mentioned in the article that he had a capacity, too, for tackling the stuff of this world, the here and now. The Jackson portrait, coming last in Arnold's review of Vetter, transitions to his discussion of artist Winslow Homer. More specifically, it immediately precedes Arnold's commentary on Homer's Civil War camp scene, The Bright Side, which contains, quote, a grotesque element that is, quote, of an entirely different order from Mr. Vetter's painting. Arnold explicitly, explicitly calls attention to the central pipe-smoking figure in Homer's work, a kind of stock caricature, or in his description, quote, a comic type. In contrasting the two artists and the two figures, the article thus suggests the seriousness and sympathy with which Vetter approaches the subject of African-American personhood and racial injustice during a time of profound national discord. The Civil War had ended barely a month earlier. What gets left out of Vetter's telling, his connecting the 1865 painting and the 1876 one, is a series of intervening depictions that fuse the identity of Jane Jackson and the Cumaean Sybil, including these two paintings, but also two unlocated drawings and a small oil sketch from the late 1860s. By 1872, Vetter had incorporated her into the expansive landscape this painting is about uh, 12 by 20 inches. But here, the overall brown monochromatic uh, coloring is retained from the 1865 uh, portrayal. Between this version, the Brooklyn version, and this version, uh, the museum at the Davis Museum at Wellesley College, which recently resurfaced on the art market uh, and from 1876, the details of her form become more defined. Notice her jewelry, for instance, and the fires from the burning books are dispersed across the landscape. But on the whole, the basic elements of the composition are basically set in the 1872 uh, watercolor. It is as if, instead, Vetter, over a period of several years, is grappling with how best to handle pigment, how to calibrate the effects of color and atmospheric vividness. In the Detroit painting, the finished one, the final one, the one here, her, her robes lighten considerably in comparison to her surroundings, contrasting more with her skin tone, as if to emphasize this attribute, perhaps. Certainly, there are clear differences, but her identity does not get completely undone in the final painting. Notable are the racial implications of the Sybil here, Jane Jackson as more than mere inspiration for subsequent works. 
Her visage was foundational to the Cumaean Sibyl, the near profile, the enshrouded head, the pensive expression. She becomes someone else, yes, and yet somehow also retains an essential similarity, an essential temperament, is somehow the same woman in a different guise. Her complexion and other ethno-racial identifiers apparently went unremarked on in critical responses to the painting when exhibited in 1840, uh, excuse me, 1878. Perhaps indicative that she was implicitly viewed as, as white by default. However, a New York newspaper article referred to the painting as the Crimean Sybil. This misidentification, however unintentional, would seem to distance her ethnically to, petition, to position her as more racially other by apparently referencing a Crimean Tatar, a Turkic ethnic group. Vedder was hardly the first to couch contemporary racial questions in the realm of ancient legend. Although there's nothing in the history of the Cumaean Sibyl to suggest an African origin, Vedder likely knew of the African racial valence bestowed on or conflated with the figure of the Sibyl broadly in these years. For example, his friend, the sculptor William Wentmore Stories, the Libyan Sybil, which Paul mentioned as well, took pains to racialize the prophetess according to perceived North African features in direct opposition to the institution of slavery, as uh, Melissa has written about as well. Similarly, the African-American abolitionist and activist Sojourner Truth was variously referred to in newspapers as Colored Sybil, Sable Sybil, American Sybil, Ancient Sybil. At least once, she described herself as the African Sybil. In the Cumaean Sybil, the idea of mood as articulated in Vedder's autobiography registers as something inexact or inchoate, a tentative feeling held over yet redirected. Thus, the trace of her countenance in the final 1876 painting is deeply connected to the racial and political turmoil that Vetter had witnessed and participated in. The remnants of violence and subjugation attached to her image, even in its transformation. The painting is not about Jane Jackson. It does not portray her as an individual. Rather, it condenses her brooding, her look of patient endurance, in Vetter's words, and her newfound, if tenuous freedom in the service of prognostication, of foreseeing plots and plans. To further discern how the painting aligns, if unwittingly, with questions of liberty and emancipation, so pertinent, so pertinent in the years that Vetter returned to and reworked the image of Jane Jackson, consider her headscarf. It owes something to the soft conical bonnet known as a liberty or Phrygian cap, it was one of the most ubiquitous symbols of the, of, in the imagery of the Civil War propaganda, seen in the 1863 Union coin at the left. Her swaddled head nearly approximates the liberty cap, which had its origins as an ancient Roman symbol of a manumitted slave. Allegories of liberty, particularly those featuring the liberty cap, were often tied with the abolishment of chattel slavery. The inclusion of the cap was controversial on a number of occasions leading up to the sectional crisis in the United States. Uh, for instance, it was explicitly seen as a provocative reference to the abolition, abolition of slavery in Thomas Crawford's second abandoned design for the Statue of Freedom atop the US Capitol in Washington, no less than Jefferson Davis, then Secretary of War and soon to be President of, President of the Confederacy, staunchly objected to the Liberty Cap based on its ostensible promotion of freedom for slaves. With this borrowing, subtle though it may be, then Vedder's painting too becomes a kind of embodiment of national sentiment, or almost. In an unsettled or imprecise way, it is as if he recreates the Cumaean Sybil in the role of a personification of independence. The Sybil becomes a quasi-stand-in for the struggle of the oppressed in a broader way. And perhaps its resonance extends beyond the United States, extends indeed to speak to Italian national formation in these decades. Prophetic visions of liberty are featured in an earlier image uh, by Antonio Massuti, 
published as the first plate of the relic of the Italian Revolution of 1850, referring to Napoleon's 1816 prediction that in the lapse of half a century, say 1870, Europe would either be wholly Republican or Cossack. Here the exiled ruler imagines a Republican figure with a liberty cap and a monarchical figure with a sword, uh, with a crown sword fighting. Napoleon's prediction had apparently actually specified 10 years, but then was variously requoted as 20, 30, 50 in subsequent iterations. Uh, in any case, uh, this 1850 publica publication calls upon Napoleon's utterance as the key anticipatory moment for the collision between progress and conservatism, between Italian self-governance and Austrian control. In picking up this thread, mixing prophecy and liberation, Fetter likewise treads into related territory in the 1870s, I think. Vetter, based in Rome from January 1867 onward, was well aware of the momentous events taking place in his adopted city. In 1870, Vetter had returned from a summer trip to London by September when the capture of Rome occurred, part of the final phase of unification. Once incorporated into the new nation, Rome, of course, became the capital the following year, not without ongoing challenges. In addition, Giuseppe uh, Mazzini, the fervent activist for unification, who was at times hailed as a quote-unquote prophet and who had ambitions of creating, quote, a third Rome, a Rome of the peoples, died in 1872 as well. Recall that Vetter painted the earliest landscape version of the Cumaean Sibyl that same year. Besides this concurrence of events, Manzini is germane here for another reason, as he had noted of his own struggle in a letter to an American abolitionist, quote, we are fighting the same sacred battle for freedom and the emancipation of the oppressed. You, sir, against Negro, we against white slavery. The cause is truly identical. Similarly, in the American abolitionist Julia Ward Howe's poem, Whit Sunday in the Church, uh, from 1854, written after her 1850-51 stay in Italy. The persecution of Italian pol political dissonance and the in inhumane treatment of American slaves share an acute kinship. The predicament of the Italian patriot and the American slave are, as the scholar uh, Paola Gemma has summarized, quote, deliberately constructed as one, the image of the tortured Italian covered in blood is paralleled by that of the whipped slave. These and other examples from the pens of both Italian patriots and American abolitionists serve to link the plight of these two groups, these two nations. Vetter's painting is, I think, attuned to this transatlantic dialogue, to this convergence between embattled peoples, to this appeal to common conviction. These networked causes become entangled in the painting, coalescing the image of the Sibyl, which carried a surfeit of cultural and historical meaning. Take, for instance, one 1862 article in which the author lists the revolutionary storms sweeping over Europe, commenting in particular on, quote, the Italian struggle and now our own civil war. These, quote, great crises are, quote, the apocalypse of providence. What was said of the Sibyl might be applied to them, end quote. Assessing Italy and America side by side, this passage employs the language of providence, of fate, of, quote, prophetic bodements in direct relation to the figure of the Sibyl. Vetter's painting, in closing, unco uncovers something of the mutual sympathy for those most affected by both conflicts, and I wonder also if it doesn't tap into yet subvert the stock image of the Italian South as vaguely, dangerously, alluringly African, as one scholar put it, that was prevalent in Italy in these years, showing the Sibyl as wise, resolute, and active agent of change, though not without caution, even pessimism, kind of mournfulness here, I think so as to undercut and complicate the emerging discourse on, on and classifications of race, particularly on the soon-to-be-held perception and condemnations of Italians in America as, to use a period phrase, quote, between white men and Negroes. Maybe Vetter's painting then taps into liminal status and ambiguity to undermine and defy racial binaries, to assert hybridity as being of to, excuse me, to assert 
the hybridity of being torn between cultures, the mingling of bothness and otherness. The painting may not answer or even directly ask such questions, but ultimately, ultimately these strands of race, liberty, and prophecy twine together in Vedder's work, offering an inventive and perceptive meditation, the meaning richer and more enigmatic than previously supposed, perhaps as mutable and unstable as the construction of race itself. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Adam. That's great. Uh, we have a, a related talk coming up now with Vetter, too, bringing us back to Florence. Uh, and Adam uh, uh, talked a little bit about that. Uh, Adrian Baxter Bell is Associate Professor of Art History at Marymount Manhattan College in New York. Her publications include George Innes and the Visionary Landscape of 2003 which accompanied an exhibition she curated for the National Academy of Design and San Diego Museum of Art, and George Innes, Writings and Reflections on Art and Philosophy, 2007. Recent work includes chapters in A Seamless Web, Euro-American Art in the 19th Century, 2014, and Locating American Art, Finding Art's Meaning in Museums, Colonial, the Colonial Period to the Present, 2016. This past April, she participated in the conference Da Buio alla Luce, Scrittore a Museo, 1798-1898, at the Museo Correr in, in uh, Venice, where she gave a talk on the 19th century American art critic and novelist Anne Hampton Brewster. Her paper today, A Reluctant Revolutionary, Elio Vetter in the Circle of the Macchiole, stems from the first chapter of her current book and exhibition project, Transnational Expatriates, Coleman, Vetter, and the Aesthetic Movement in Gilded Age Italy. Please welcome Adrian Bell. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you to all of the organizers, Melissa, Paul, and Daniele. This is a, such an interesting conference and um, so many ideas coming out of it. It's been so profitable already for me as a scholar. And I wanted to thank you. I know there's a lot of work, work went into this. And uh, it's, it's just wonderful uh, to have this opportunity to, uh, to participate. So thank you for that. Adam and I didn't um, talk about our presentations before, but you'll see a, an exact pairing that I used in my presentation that he just used. Um, this talk is really an expansion of uh, the beginning of his talk, which you, um, which you just heard. So I guess I'm in a, kind of, in a way fleshing out uh, many of the, the ideas that he presented in that, in that early section. Spectacle. Perhaps no country reifies that word as well as Italy. Its stratifications of the remains of nearly all of Western civilization have left visitors marveling. Renaissance churches in Florence and the ruins of Pompeii, the piazzas of Venice, and the Roman fountains of Bernini. Italy's artistic heritage never shies from the besotted gaze of the viewer. Indeed, it seems to welcome the ceaseless attention. Author of Six Months in Italy, George Stillman Hillard, whom uh, Paul just mentioned, claimed that, quote, no soil has produced so many great men, none has left so abundant a heritage to the contemporary spirit, none has passed through so many changes, none offers so many attractions, end quote. Indeed, no group of artists was more aware of this cultural and historical bounty than the Americans who visited Italy during the 19th century. From Thomas Cole to James McNeil Whistler, from Thomas Crawford to Maurice Prendergast, they all felt the lure of Italy, the inspiration of its spectacularity. 
physics tells us that glare is caused by a significant ratio of luminescence between the object observed and the observer. Likewise, the intersection of spectator and spectacle in Rome can generate glare that obscures lesser known stories, yet to be told, of 19th century American artists and the Italy they encountered. The story or history uncovered today bypasses the familiar, the familiar representations of towering landmarks and majestic public squares. Instead, it describes, at least in part, a more complex, nuanced, and reciprocal relationship uh, between a different gr group of American landscape painters and Macchiaioli, their Italian counterparts. It invites us to reconsi reconsider a number of entrenched interpretations. The fact that one of these American artists, Elihu Vedder, was regularly the Gothic tradition in America. In the eyes of many, he is an outsider, an isolato, even someone haunted, as one scholar has written, by mental monsters. To be sure, the paintings such as the Medusa, represented here, attest to this interpretation. Vedder envisions this famous creature, well known for her hideous face and for the living venomous snakes that have vanquished her hair, as a bizarre hybrid both terrifying and pitiable. It is the type of complex interpretation that has overshadowed the artist's more ostensibly benign Italian landscapes. In his exchanges with the Macchiaioli, Vetter was joined by his closest friend and compatriot, the artist Charles Carroll Coleman. Unlike Vetter, Coleman has been almost entirely forgotten in the literature on 19th century American art. On the right, I show a newly discovered lyrical view from Coleman's studio window in Rome. Both artists expatriated to Italy as young men. When they anchored their lives to the company and imagery of the Macchiaioli, they embraced the artistic and political causes championed by these Italian artists. They became, I will argue, uh, reluctant revolutionaries. The peripatetic Henry Miller once wrote, quote, it would have been easier for me to make myself at home anywhere on earth, I think, than in America. I miss Europe and I yearn for Greece, and I'm always dreaming of Tibet. I feel least of all like an American, though I am probably more American than anything else. Vetter and Coleman seem to have felt the same. Vetter once claimed, quote, I shall never belong to any country but the United States of America, but my dreams have always been of Italy." End quote. Both artists spent the majority of their lives, lives in Tuscany and Rome. Later in life, they migrated to the island of Capri. While remaining wholly American, Vetter and Coleman grappled throughout their lives with their attraction to Italy and Italian nationalism. In 1856, Vetter persuaded his father, who had resisted his son's burgeoning interest in art, to finance a trip to Europe that would represent his last opportunity for free play before he found a secure job in America, which of course he never did. He returned to Italy in 1860 and took art classes. It is an un underreported fact that Vetter, who developed into one of the finest draftsmen in America, stated that he learned to draw from the Italian artist Raffaello Buonaiuti. Buonaiuti did not simply encourage Vetter to pursue disegno, the expected course of study. Instead, as Vetter recalled in his autobiographical The Digressions of V, when he asked Buonaiuti how he was going to color a composition that he had just drawn to his satisfaction on canvas, Buonaiuti answered, nella maniera di Tiziano, in other words, at the start of his artistic career, Vetter was regularly exposed to the works of the patriarch of the Pittura di Macchia. In Florence in 1860, Vetter uh, started to frequent the Café Michelangelo, which served as the informal meeting house for the Macchiaioli, pictured here in a well-known group photograph. Vetter and the Italian artist must have quickly recognized their mutual goals. For his part, Vetter hoped to escape oppressive paternal expectations for his life in America. 
Moreover, while he was treated well by the National Academy of Design, he was elected academician in 1865, early in his painting career, he resisted conforming to their expectations. He was not drawn to the type of meticulously constructed landscape paintings that had long characterized the work of American artists. Thomas Cole's interpretation of the Roman aqueduct painted in 1832 would have seemed overly finished to someone who was attracted to the lessons of Thomas Couture and William Morris Hunt. Instead, to incarnate the assuming setting of landscape with sheep and old well, pictured on the right, which Vetter painted in Italy around 1860, he modeled scumbled and streaked colors, constructing rough-hewn forms through the temporal act of mark making. Bearing this painting in mind, we can see how Vetter stated in the digressions, quote, that, quote, the finishing of a picture is the death of the sketch. Meanwhile, the Macchiaoli saw the Florentine Academy as a form of artistic oppression. Their artistic landscape had been populated with work such as Pietro ben Benvenuti's Hercules Fighting the Centaurs, a fresco in the Salon of Hercules in the Palazzo Pitti. Benvenuti had been trained in the Florentine Academy and, later in Rome, studied the dictates of Winkelmann and the example of Mengs. In 1809, Napoleon, who had been in power since 1799, installed his sister as Grand Duchess of Florence two years after the annexation of Tuscany to France. She was determined to turn Florence into the new Athens of Italy. She held court in the Palazzo Pitti, where Benvenuti offered a somewhat impure form of neoclassicism in that he combined heroic figures in a frieze-like setting, but shaped his composition around a rather heavy-handed Baroque structure. Vedder and Coleman would have affiliated these highly polished historical scenes with the works of the Pre-Raphaelites, which Vedder critiqued as, quote, needlessly hard and crude. For him, their exaggerations of color and, quote, inessential details classified them as emblems of convention. Emancipation from the academies, national and Florentine, arrived through the Macchia. Both American and Italian artists found in this form, this stain or mark, a vehicle to convey the artist's authentic, sincere relationship to the motif. While artists had long gone out of doors to sketch and to store images uh, for their use in paintings that they would finish in the studio, the Macchiaioli, as Norma Brood has observed, went all'aperto to record their own experiences of nature's light and the, quote, personal responses these experiences had evoked. And as such, Brood continued, quote, the sketches became not only the formal, but also the expressive foundations for these artists' finished pictures, end quote. As a result, Macchiaioli artists derived inspiration from work such as Raffaello Cernese's Roofs in Sunlight, in which the artist translated his elegiac perceptions of sunlight and shade on rustic Italian farmhouses into judiciously constructed blocks of pastel hues. Vetter's painting from the mid-1860s show how in his early attraction to the Macchia uh, initiate, show his, how his early attraction to the Macchia initiated a new inventive direction for his art. In Roman Campania, we can sense his primary interest not in capturing a fleeting impression of light on an old country wall, but instead in attempting to build the form through his brushwork. The multi-directional strokes of paint in the lower block attest, um, I'm sorry, reflect his analytic approach to fabricating the rectangularity of the form. He might even have used a palette knife to apply the thick layers of pigment on the right side uh, of the arch. These are architectonic brushstrokes that create pictorial dimension. The tight framework of the composition means that, that the geometric relationships of the forms, the semicircle of the arch, the rectangular blocks of the wall, the cylindrical shape of the pillar, and even the circular shape of the ball finial in the upper right corner 
take precedence over the traditional, sing over traditional single point perspective. Inspired by the artistic potential of the Machia, Vetter reveals his immersion in the process of painting. Here is his fundamentally modern approach, evoking, I would say, Cezanne to constructive aesthetics. Anticipating Cezanne. <laughs> Vetter was drawn to the Machiaioli for a second reason. He supported their affiliation with politics and their desire to see a unified Italy. The Machiaioli championed the ideals of the Risorgimento and, according to Dario Dorbe, quote, intuitively understood that they were a living and integral part of modern culture, <coughs> unquote. They put themselves in, quite literally, the avant-garde. After the narrow French victory over the Austrians at Magenta on 4 June 1859, the patriots clustered around Garibaldi who would begin his quest to liberate Sicily and Naples from the Austrians in 1860. Macchiaioli artists Eduardo Borani, Giuseppe Abbati, and Raffaello Cernesi all joined Garibaldi's red shirts. In 1862, they would attempt to liberate Rome from papal control. While they would be turned back at Mentana in 1867, they would find liberation in 1870 at the Porta Pia. Throughout this period, Giovanni Fattori, also joined the conversations at the Cafe Michelangelo. There he was exposed not only to politics, but also to the expressive macchia, and to the practice of building form through patterns of illumination captured in brushwork. The lively, dynamic painting of a soldier near his encampment tent is one of several that led to the larger, more detailed, and more famous Italian camp after the Battle of Magenta, 1859 to 62. In Fattori's own words, quote, he shows us the, quote, scrupulous study of nature, as it is and as it appears. The person who served the bifurcated role of both artistic and political leader for the Machiaioli and for Vetter and Coleman was Giovanni Nino Costa. Costa had fought under Garibaldi in 1838 and would volunteer in the Second Italian War of Independence in 1859. He would join the Italian army that breached the Aurelian Walls, famously on 20 September, and placed Rome under a state of siege shortly before the surrender of the papal forces of Pius IX in 1870. Vetter and Costa quickly bonded. Indeed, according to Vetter scholar Regina Soria, quote, Costa became one of Vetter's lifelong friends and his favorite sketching trip companion. He introduced Vetter to the seascape of the Turanian coast and to the badlands near Volterra. Vetter referred to Costa as the Etruscan, not only because the Italian artists loved the landscape on which Etruscan civilization had flourished, but also because he represented the great love of Italian history and culture for which the patriots were fighting. Costa would introduce Vetter to places in the Roman Campania that were unknown to all but the Romani di Roma. Together, they traveled to such sites as Porto d'Anzio and Palo, cities on the Mediterranean. Housed today in the La Dispoli municipality, Palo used to identify the ancient Etruscan town of Alzium, one of the oldest cities in Etruria. Later, wealthy Romans, including Marcus Aurelius, envisioned their retirement there and built extravagant villas. This fresh, lively view of an ancient Italian seaport again challenges the asymmetrical view of Vetter as a Gothic artist. It aligns him instead with the prevailing Italian campaign to illuminate the ancestral features communal to Italian culture. While living in Rome, Costa established his studio at 33 Via Marguta. He would work there from 1852 to 1902. Olivio Rossetti Agresti derived information for Costa's first biography from many conversations with the artist. Vetter called it a beautiful book. Agresti noted that while Costa was often hounded by the papal police, quote, he managed when he wished to talk politics and organize conspiracies in the studio in Via Marguta, end quote. Vetter may have joined those conversations. 
He referred to himself, as noted, as a rank Republican and noted proudly that he, quote, fraternized with the soldiers. Moreover, both Vetter and Coleman fervently supported the American Civil War, another battle for liberation and unification, which started during their formative years in Rome. In the winter of 1862, Coleman returned to the United States to fight for the Union's cause. After being commissioned first lieutenant, he was wounded in the jaw and in the spring of 1863, honorably discharged. Vetter and Coleman spent the next four years in New York. Vetter then returned to Rome via Paris in December 1865. Coleman could hold out only until the following March. In January 1867, the two finally settled in Rome, where they both rented a studio at 33 Via Marguta, the same building that housed Costa Studio. While neither Coleman nor Vetter could fight with the Italian patriots, their physical proximity to Costa exposed them to key issues in the fight for Italian liberation and unification. Like the Macchiaioli, they too were in the avant-garde of both art and politics. Joined by Frederick Layton and William Richmond, the five artists often met at the Cafe Greco and went on sketching trips together. The dates of these two compositions make it clear that Coleman and Costa did not paint the same Italian shepherd with his characteristic chocaria footwear at the same time. However, the two representations are close enough to suggest that Coleman studied Costa's version and sought to produce his own rendition. The support that Coleman used, artist, Artists Board, suggested he worked from a model out of doors. Coleman and Costa represented the figure from virtually the same perspective, though Coleman placed him in the more dramatic setting of the sharply inclined hill, complete with the setting sun in the distance. These and kindred paintings show that Costa exposed Vetter and Coleman to deep-seated Italian customs and traditions. For Costa, and I would like to argue for the two Americans, such traditions were not merely artistic motifs. They represented features of Italian history that patriots sought to preserve within a unified Italian nation. Other works by Coleman and Vetter from the 1860s and 1870s show that they plunged into subject matter that had been almost entirely overlooked by their American artist contemporaries. For his part, Coleman was manifestly drawn to the Chocardi and the Fiferari, residents of the Roman Campania, who wore traditional Italian folk costumes. Here, by way of example, I show Coleman's Outside the Walls of 1868. The figures are generally, uh, sorry, gen uh, generically identified by their choce, or zampiti. These are strapped shoes constructed of a large sole, S-O-L-E, bound to the leg by leather straps that wrap around the foot and leg. They are worn over so-called patches, that is, single strips of white completely envelop the foot, ankle, and calf. While the specific types of traditional clothing vary from region to region. Most men wear long capes with pants to the knees. Women wear white blouses and long skirts. They cover their heads with tovali. The choche, footwear, is particularly distinctive and characteristic of Latium, the region that gave the ancient Roman language its name, uh, and the region that contains Rome. Coleman's painting shows his distinct appreciation for the characteristic clothing of the residents. These clothes were worn in an effort to perform and maintain religious, sartorial, and municipal traditions, all ultimately nationalistic efforts. Indeed, Via Marguta, the street on which Coleman, Vetter, and Costa all maintained their studios, was and remains the street in Rome most frequently inhabited by artists. Assisting these artists were models that were closely affiliated with the street. In this photograph, probably taken in the 1870s, they are seen playing Il Gioco della Mora on Via Flaminia, one of the oldest games in recorded history, dated, by the way, to the 
uh, ancient uh, Egyptian period, uh, on one of the oldest roads in Rome. The setting and the arrangement of the three figures on the far left here, recall the setting and figural group in Coleman's Outside the Walls. Indeed, Via Flaminia begins at the Porta del Popolo, formerly known as the Porta Flaminia, the uh, gate to the ancient Aurelian walls that surrounded Rome. This road is therefore outside the walls. Moreover, Coleman may have used specific Via Marguta models for his painting, such as Filomena di Anticoli, known as Nena, here, and Maria Curti, seen here in a photograph at the upper left. It is possible, too, that the entire family of the model Rampino, seen in the lower left corner, served as models for Coleman, and specifically for the figures of the shepherd and little boy in this painting. All three members of this family were known to have posed for several artists, including the Perugian painter Domenico Bruschi, the Sienese painter Cesare Macari, and the Roman painter Pietro Barucci. These are speculations, of course, as the characters in Coleman's paintings are fairly generic types. Still, the prevalence of so many models in this area during the years in which Coleman painted his characteristically Roman scenes suggests that he could easily have worked with several of them uh, to represent and celebrate authentic Italian customs. Many years later, Coleman would continue to feature this type of subject, um, the sub type of subjects that the Macchiaioli artists represented. While living on the island of Capri after around 1886, uh, he turned not to the famous landmarks of the island for his subject matter. Indeed, not once in his 40 years on the island did he paint the famous blue grotto or natural arch. Not once did he paint the piazzetta, located only, located only steps from his home in Villa Narcissus. Instead, as we see in this painting uh, of around 1890, he extended the philosophy of the Macchiaioli by painting local residents going about their daily routines, such as binding and carrying uh, bushels of brush from Anacapri. Coleman's brushwork clearly recalls the Macchia technique evident in the earlier kindred work of brush gatherers by the Macchiaiolo Cristiano Banti. In both paintings, the women are nearly obscured by the enormous stacks of wood uh, on their shoulders as they stride across the frontal plane of an open-ended horizontal landscape. The very format of the painting evokes the perpetuity of their labor. While these local heroes may have been overlooked by the vast majority of American painters, they represent precisely the types of authenticity that attracted Coleman and that, for Banti, fueled the, the cause of Risorgimento. Traces of medieval and Renaissance Italy that surrounded Vetter, Coleman, and the Macchiaioli provided another uh, access, uh, sorry, access to another symbol of Italian nationalism. My Florence, Vetter once wrote, was a beautiful city filled with figures fresh from the frescoes of Ghirlandaio or Giotto or Cimabue, end quote. Indeed, this preoccupation with the romantic past pervaded the lives of these artists. Cristiano Banti imagined the scene of Torquato Tasso and Eleonora d'Este in a painting that ideally blends the artist's medievalism with his Machia brushwork. Here's the same pair. <laughs> in 1860, Vincenzo Cabianca, another member of the Machiaioli and a friend of Vetter's, pictured Florentine storytellers of the 14th century. A bit more than a decade later, Vetter would paint a kindred scene, the music party which in its tenor and composition paid tribute to Cabianca's work. For several years in the 1870s, Coleman found his calling uh, in scenes of the medieval past. One of several iterations on the theme, the mandolin player on the right, offers an exquisite interplay of colors, fabrics, and decorative objects. Elsewhere, he used the same model and setting to picture vibrant, the vibrant imagination of medieval lute players. The backgrounds of Coleman's paintings are particularly striking, 
with their elaborate tapestries showing medieval hunting teams and their tents. While Kelman never fully adopted the macchia style of the macchiaioli during this period, and while he often painted meticulously, these works are rooted in the macchiaioli reinvention of the medieval world during the 1860s and 1870s. While we may never know the name of the model that Coleman used in the painting on the right, he may have been inspired by Vetter himself, who had a penchant for dressing in costume. He included this portrait of himself, and I like I found this somewhere else, he put it in his own book, in the digressions of V. Moreover, he is known to have dressed in costume, complete with red tights, for the Relief Fund Ball, which was organized by foreign residents in Rome to raise funds for the victims of the flood of 1870. Rome appears to have hosted kindred events on a regular basis. In 1892, a younger group of Via Marguta artists, which included Cesare Biseo, Augusto Alberici, and Aurelio Tiratelli, organized a corteo quattrocentesco. It would have been easy to assume that these activities and the paintings that they inspired represented fantastical escapes into a 15th century dream world, mere theatrical productions of free-spirited artists. I would suggest, however, that they embodied efforts on the part of Vedder, Coleman, and the Macchiaioli to recall the great traditions of Italian history and culture, traditions that fueled the desire for national unity among the Italian people. Vetter, Coleman, and the Macchiaioli used yet another uh, artistic means of recalling Italian history in their works. For the format of their paintings, they often adopted the shape of the Italian cassone or predella. Vetter spent many hours with Thomas Hotchkiss and Nino Costa, roaming the Tuscan countryside in search of inspiring motifs. He saw the Signorellis in Cortona and even Signorellis the School of Penn, famously destroyed during World War II, which the artist had presented to Lorenzo de' Medici. He surely would have seen the elongated predella pictured here with its continuous narrative painted in 1516 by Signorelli for his Santa Croce deposition in Umbertide and many others of its type. I show this just as an example. Nino Costa, a leading source of inspiration to the Macchiaioli artists, used the same elongated format for his of 1855. Giuseppe Abbati used it in many compositions, including landscape at Castiglioncello, seen here below the work of Costa. In the, 18, in the 1860s and 1870s, and even much later, Vedder and Coleman both adopted the format, adapted the format for many of their own paintings, uh, though in in some cases, they turned the composition vertically. True to the Macchiaioli philosophy, Coleman downplayed the importance of famous landmarks in his view of Florence, painted in 1870 on the left. While we see the tower of the Palazzo Vecchio and Giotto's Campanile, they acquiesce to the rustic power of the trees, which nearly frame, neatly frame the composition. Coleman adopted the vertical format for his interior of the Bargello, painted in 1870. Here he makes the character characteristic decision not to show any of the famous objects in the museum, but instead to picture an evocative slice of its medieval architecture. Dating to 1225, the building of the Bargello Museum is the oldest in Florence. It originally housed the highest magistrate of the city council. That he painted the scene only five years after it opened as a museum suggests that he was acutely aware of the powerful role that the medieval building, not simply its collection, maintained uh, within Florentine and by extension Italian history. Now the residence of the British ambassador to Rome, the Villa Volkonsky on the left, had been home to the Russian princess uh, Zinaida Volkonskaya, whom Coleman may have known. Layered with historical references, the villa hosted an array of literary luminaries, including Stendhal, uh, Sir Walter Scott, and Nikolai Gogol. Through the tight framing of the vertical format, 
Coleman calls attention to this compelling seg segment of recent Italian history, which had largely been overlooked by monument-seeking American painters. Coleman revived the format many years later for a glimpse into an anonymous Capri garden. He captures the quixotic tenor of life on the island by featuring two improbably superimposed columns, an architectural impossibility and framing them in the Predella-inspired format. Vetter adapted the format for his Torri de Schiavi, a rare representation for him of a famous site. And he used it again in an oniric composition, Night Scene by the Water on the right. Ultimately, this vertical Predella format offered the American artists a chance to break from the widely accepted tradition of horizontal landscape painting. It gave them, quite literally, a new direction in their art. At the same time, it signaled their immediate affiliation with the avant-garde art and political ambitions of the Machiavelli. The Predella format and rural subject matter of their paintings suggest that Vetter, Coleman, and the Machiavelli believed that seemingly unremarkable settings could, in fact, possess a powerful expressive ability. As they eschewed the famous sites, the Colosseum, the Forum, the Via Appia Antica, and so on, they worked often together to illuminate facets of the Italian landscape, such as this vignette in Perugia, that were known, that were well known only to their immediate inhabitants. For Vetter, these places shimmered with excitement. As he wrote in the digressions, quote, a friend and myself had seen from Perugia certain amethystine peaks beyond the great hills and were told that they were the mountains of Gubbio and we went to Gubbio to see them, end quote. For Costa and the Macchiaioli, these rural settings, such as the river flats along the Arno and the orchards of Florence, represented the real Italy that fostered generations of Italians and their culture. The landscape could see into the past. It possessed, I would argue, a form of historic vision. It overlooked a terrain and absorbed the historical record of its inhabitants. It possessed a form of a kind of field of vision that could be contained in and referenced through the artist's brush. In this way, the seemingly anonymous settings became charged with historical import, with a sense of italianità, it became a vehicle for political revolution. In 2002, the Galleria d'Arte Moderna e Contemporanea in San Gimignano hosted an exhibition entitled Viaggiatori Appassionati, Elihu Vedder e altri paesaggisti americani dell'Ottocento in Italia. In an essay in the catalog, Gabriella Borghini observed that, quote, Vetter is a painter known in Italy only by a small number of experts and collectors, end quote. The same rings true for Coleman, despite his having lived and worked in Italy for most of his adult life. Likewise, in America, the Machiaioli remain overshadowed by French Impressionists, whose familiar and pleasing subjects fueled their art historical and commercial popularity. The sites represented in Machiavelli paintings were familiar to Italians, but rarely visited by American tourists. They failed, therefore, to attract the attention of most writers, scholars, and collectors, and curators, the people who decide how we are to understand the past. The fact that Vetter and Coleman knew, worked with, and appreciated the political ideals and artistic inventions of the Machiaioli positions them as perceptive and prescient artists. It shows that they were neither isolated nor spellbound by visionary Gothic imagery. We must read Vetter in the proper context. When he writes in the digressions about how in the 1860s, quote, he took so little interest in the great events going on about me, end quote, he is somewhat understandably overlooking precisely those events in which he was most deeply engaged. That is, the invention of new painting by the Machiaioli, 
when he writes in the same passage about, he, about how he was, quote, more under the influence of the merry spirit of Boccaccio than that of the stern Ghibelline, end quote, we, we must remember that having used the vernacular to write his great Decameron, Boccaccio became a nationalist hero to the patriots of the Risorgimento. For Vedder and Coleman, nationalism was not expressed only through political protest. Instead, it meant celebrating the people and customs distinct to the Italian peninsula. This celebration can be read in the lutenists and literary characters of the medieval past, the physical form of the early Renaissance predella, the macchia with its typographic connection to Titian and late Renaissance painting, the Via Marguta models, and the features of the Italian countryside known only to locals. Seeking freedom from circumscribed American artistic and social values, Vetter and his circle empathized through their art with the Italian causes of independence and unification. Joining forces with such native artist patriots as Nino Costa, the Americans and Italians produced a collection of landscapes and genre scenes and some visionary images that brought a sense of authentic Italy, the Italy that the revolutionaries sought to preserve through armed conflict to American and Italian audiences for the first time. Vedder has long maintained a tenured position in the canon of American art what I've argued for today is a new, broader, and more accurate interpretation of his larger position and that of Coleman within Italo-American transnationalism. Thank you. Thank you.